Testing. Unit 1, 2, and 3 are melted down. Testing. Testing. Hi, folks. Hi, Zoe. Well, get down if you don't want to stay up over there. Come see Dana. Come on. That's my puppy. Hi, Mama Knox. Donna Bell. Elizabeth M. Junkyard Flyer. Kurtzer K. Camshaft. Zoe. Sylvia Shawcross. Christopher Taylor. Don't mind me if I butcher his names, folks. That's me. Ain't Chester. Uh, Jimmy Joe Smith. Uh, thanks, Broken Ass Oil Alert. QC Oil Alert, I should say. Uh, what kind of radiation did they find there? I seen your message last night and I caught you one earlier today, uh, a couple hours ago. Hi, Sylvia. Shawcross. Did I do that twice? There I did. Good, good stuff. Uh, Macon Buck, Miss Frill, Zip Fry, uh, False Flag America, 8675, Stormy Cloud, D. Canterbury. Boom, boom. I can't pronounce that name, and you sent me how to pronounce it. Uh, Usalis, Y S A L Y S. You don't see that name too often. In fact, I don't think I've seen it before. Albert, uh, Philip, Ivan, Sergeant York, um, Third Watch, Anna Beck, Lunar, and just passing through. I just watched your video uh, just a few minutes ago, five minutes ago, just before I came on, just as before I came on here. There's a lot of pain in your voice, understandably. That's what you hear each night, right? Um, we're almost in the middle of a six-year countdown to extinction of life in the Pacific Ocean because of Fukushima. And it's safe to say that no sea life is safe or safe to eat or safe, safe from uh, Fukushima's death plumes that have invaded our oceans unprecedented and will destroy that ocean. Uh, every day, ocean currents are hardly the only mode of these death plumes. Each day, there's uh, thousands of miles of clouds that form over the Pacific Ocean by evaporation and are carried far away, right around the entire Pacific Rim, all over Canada, all over the United States, all over Vietnam, all over the wreckage, the carnage that is the Philippines who were inundated with over 50 feet of radiated water. Um, and that's now night after night, day after day, week after week, month after month, year now after year, till the very end of time, nothing will change that. And hi Nancy Redstart, Patrick, Alex, uh, Wiry Cottleman, good name. And Robert, an aviator. Kevin. Uh, nuts for Art, 333, folks. I'll just see if I can catch any other names. Hi, John. Make is looking. Um... Yeah, doing pretty good tonight. Pretty. Hi, Red Button Studios. Another one I never got. Because you guys put your comment down just as I came on here, I would imagine, because i never seen it there. I tried to grab everybody that was there, so I, for a change, I don't forget anybody. And I know I did, and I will. And there's people that shows up and leaves um, their comments after, and I never remember to say thank you. And I understand that, but I do give people at least a couple hours just in case they're online, they, they get a chance, they can catch it live. And the idea, of course, <coughs> is, uh, sorry, is after years and years of filmmaking, I just, this is easier for me, theoretically speaking, 
and now it's turned into uh, 40 something days in a row some crazy days I'm probably gonna offend everybody at some point because uh, normally that's just the way life is particularly when you're sitting on the other side of this operation and it's hard to keep me in context of who I am and what I'm about and why I say the things I do because I couldn't possibly cover that in an hour I can't possibly explain that to every single person that comes to my site and I know for a fact that I offend people because um, I am arrogant about what you know the things that I know when it comes to that and I'm I'm passionate and I'm also I don't take it because I've been at this for so many years and I've seen how people have been destroyed by PR firms and by the smear machine and the slander machine and that makes me angry now more so than ever when I see these creatures up on the comment sections and I lash out I'm just I'm no different than you uh, the media equates this killer radiation uh, th with harmless background radiation that all life on this planet is acclimated to over billions of years of evolution. Everything on this planet is acclimated to the background radiation and they're the genetic superior of uh, Earth's selections over billions of years that are used to that harmless, insignificant background radiation. If you're on Earth, you know, there's only a little bit of different types of isotopes, even though they try to muddle the water, but everything that's made by man is not indigenous to this planet. And the nuclear public relation firms and media uses insignificant radiation, background radiation, like bananas like water, like rocks, and potatoes, and sunlight that are natural. And they equate that with, hang on folks, that's the pool, look, the rocks in that pool, yeah, that's, that's uh, the background radi radiation and that'll kill you, right? And that ocean, that model is based upon two weeks. Two weeks. Dispersion that they lied about, so it's not even a true model of the dispersion. You can't dilute uh, radio, radiation, radioisotopes, nucleoids, the isotopes. It can't be done, see? Because, once again, to make you really truly understand it, is that if you took a drop normally out of that ocean, anywhere, and put it under a microscope, a little drop, there'd be millions of lives. They're creatures. Animals, what they describe, anyway. They call them animals. And if you took an isotope and put it anywhere near that, they all blow up at the same time. And the ocean is dependent upon that for everything. You know how you can't live without gut bacteria, for instance. How you can't live without certain... Uh, your body is full of that stuff, right? Pounds and pounds and pounds of creatures in your body, on your body, in your body. And your body needs that to function, period. But that ocean, that dispersion model you're looking at, with just a two-week uh, release that TEPCO is insignificant to what's truly went out there, we'll get to, that alone, see, destroys most just that little tiny release destroys almost all of that, uh, the plankton, the protoplanktons, the making the oxygen, the oxygen ability of the ocean, the very, very foundation of the ocean itself is the microorganisms in all the tidal pools. That's the nursery for the entire ocean, is the shallow water anyway. Um, and the ocean comes in and crashes and liberates uh, more oxygen every time it crashes into the coastline. So it's a rich environment right along the entire coastline. And that's why you see mussels have developed uh, the glue so they can hang on. That's why the barnacles have developed those glues to hang on because of the ocean crashing relentlessly. 
since the beginning of time into the coastline and that the Grim Reaper is coming for all creatures in our ocean. There is no way that we can avoid that and so we have to think about the rest of life on the planet and how to deal with the fact that this is going to spill over into all oceans and swallow and uh, uh, hang on a second you see those that that headline there that's uh, they're talking about 9,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures coming out of the three melted cores in Fukushima and so the, there's a mountain there and there's a natural river that runs underneath this. These cores at 9,000 degrees, 2,000 degrees will melt rocks. And so it will eat itself right down to the bedrock. But once it hits the bedrock, it's surrounded by a natural old river. And rivers exist because they have eaten out all the topsoil and went down to the bedrock. And that's why they have been in that same spot for many thousands of years. But they will wear that away over millenniums or over millions of years. And what you got to remember is that every time it's running over one of those three melted cores, and we're not talking about uh, reactor number three, which is two million times worse than any other reactor on the planet. So that's like two million reactors hemorrhaging into the Pacific Ocean that should be on that model. But even if Unit 3 didn't exist, Unit 1 is three times the size of Chernobyl. Chernobyl was a 30% meltdown. Unit 3, or Unit 1 rather, look what we're talking about, was three times bigger and was 100% meltdown. So that's nine times Chernobyl if you don't take into the equation, first off, that it was different fuels. Chernobyl was the graphite, Fukushima was uh, hell on earth, uh, that's the gallows life, but that Fukushima was hell on earth uh, concoctions. This was a military industrial machine that made nuclear power as a byproduct. And on the top of the roof of number one, number two, number three, and number four were fuel pools. And the fuel pools consist of rods that have been used in the reactor and that are considered no longer high performance but still have to be put in the sarcophagus for a billion years. And there is no technology that exists that could do that, but yet they kept marching on and producing this massive, inconceivable amount of toxins. And these isotopes, like I was saying earlier, hang on, i got to move down a page. Let me skip a bit. I had done all this earlier, so I wouldn't have to do this. And that's the extra heater you can hear running. So that headline you're looking at now, there's a link below to that one. Make sure I grab the right one here. Canada busted, covering up spikes in Fukushima's radiation. And there's also a link below to a PDF filed further down. But that'll be your first or your second link below. And this was the Washington blog. And what they done was they reported, uh, actually a few days after I had reported on it and other people had reported on it just two days before that. And so it was starting to spread out. And now it's moving out pretty fast that nine days after Fukushima, the Canadian government had flew right along the entire coastline for 18 hours and discovered that it was a snowstorm of invisible, high radioactive particulates flooding the coastlines and the interior of British Columbia and Canada. This was nine days after. There was a continuous plume that never stopped. And so, this is a very important equation that people um, need to take into consideration. And there's a peer review study that I also included. It's the first or second link below. And I gotta bring up that one because this stuff is complicated. And it generally breaks down to 
the fact that they put salt water on the reactors, you cre the sulfur created these uh, buckyballs, right? And in the center of it, that's where the uraniums, the strontiums, plutoniums, and the different family tree, the hideously named different family trees, the daughters of these. And remember, there was a lot of uranium-238 on that site, because that's a weaponized enrichment facility. And it's been uh, said many times by reliable people that there was also a secret bunker under the mountain where they were using for the uh, highly enriched Right? So they were doing two million times in number three reactor in order to create something that they were making inside of that mountain, which was probably it was probably a laser facility type, uh, a directed energy weapon type. And that's why you're creating these particular types of isotopes. I'll come, come right back to these buckyballs here in a second. But the reason uh, we've been making power for 40 years ago, and there's no reason to be having something two million times more dangerous from the plutonium, the uranium, and, the, and uh, the actual thousands of weaponized isotopes in these concoctions in order to solve equations, in order to uh, validate uh, equations, or to even to see if a theory is going to be possible by just validating a little tiny parts of equations that they're looking at. And they want this technology because they're desperate to get off the planet. That's all they ever think about. That's all they ever been at, up to. And there's 4,200 peer review academic studies every day that are locked away in the peer review academic journals that we paid for it, and that the copyrights are given to just a handful of the big corporations. Uh, Wiley, Springer, and elsewhere gets the best ones, and they own uh, 22,000 of the most prestigious academic peer review journals on the planet, and they don't pay anything for copyrights, and they don't kick back. And so what we are suggesting also, I'll come right back to this part for a minute, is that we have to start swinging all of our technology to deal with the crisis that we can't deny much longer, that we truly can't deny very much longer. The Philippines was your wake-up call uh, because when you're thinking about... Is that you, Zoe? What are you doing? Snoring? Okay, sorry. The Philippines, there's nothing left standing. 7,000 islands and archipelagos, and there's nothing left standing. And whatever is left standing doesn't have any kind of structural integrity left to it. It's been peppered full of holes because the entire region became airborne projectiles. So if you look up F4 tornadoes, you see that they're a quarter mile wide when they're really, really big and that they travel for maybe six miles, and that's really, really, has always been considered just insane. That would be an insane tornado. And a tornado, that's fear, okay? That puts fear into you. If you're somewhere and someone screams tornado, even if it's a little one, you're gonna have fear. There's nothing you can do about it, whether you experienced it before or not. You're gonna have fear, because you'll hear it, you'll understand this is unbelievable. Well, that was a 100-mile F4 tornado that tore apart 7,000 islands, every life, every hospital, every school, all the infrastructure, every telephone pole, every tree, certainly these impoverished houses, with no warning. Most of these people are living on a dollar or two dollars a day. At least you'll get a 30-second warning or a minute warning when that's coming this way. And because the Pacific Ocean, the reason this happened is because those molecules, see, radiation, you don't determine radiation by heat, you determine radiation by how fast the molecules are excited, right? And so as this hemorrhaging that's going into the ocean consistently, constantly, every day, at a rate of around, it used to get a million gallons per reactor to cool it down and they made the steam with that and used that to make power and sold that as a byproduct. But they need that million gallons just to turn the keys on these things per minute. And it's 1,440 minutes in a day and there's three reactors that are melted down and disappeared 
And the New York Times would come out and try to claim, oh, it's just splattered all over the inside of the building, and they got to go in there with their sticks and knock it off some point in the future. Right? Because they don't want you to think about how that's going to stay together. Now think about how mercury works, how it sucks itself back together. And think about how if you, in a foundry where you got all this heat and it draws everything into it, that's how come it stays together in the foundries the way it does, even though it splatters and everything like that. It still stays together because of the intense heat. The, cons the center heat is so intense in 9,000 degree Fahrenheit that it keeps those splatters from being able to stay anywhere but in that contained ball, not contained ball, but that ball that will consume everything in its past. And that's why we heard about like the China syndromes where the nuclear, you know, that's not a fiction. It's actually going to burn down to Argentina uh, in this case, but that's the way it works. So once it hits the bedrock that thousands of years of that river had ate away to, which is what it's designed to do, they had built up the nuclear power plant first on 100 foot of topsoil. And so right off the bat, remember that each pool had that disappeared on the three react two reactors for sure, and we think there's a pool that disappeared on the four, uh, number two, and we still need high quality footage to be 100%. We know that the unit four went dry, and I covered that a few videos back with the screenshots and uh, zooms of high quality to show that it actually, there was no net on the number four, that it was dry indeed, and that they had uh, photoshopped that in order to try to deceive people that there was a tarp or a net there. That pool went dry too. That was on the fifth floor, I think it is. Now, let me come back to the buckyballs, because that's so important. Because remember the 9,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. And so all the rods, and let me show you one more time what that looks like. So down the center of that, around 100 feet down or something, is going to be the core. And there's 9,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures coming up. And so it creates what that peer review study I got linked up to you below. This one right here. And it talks about how these balls become uh, little nuclear engines because they can in ingest, like the buckyball, like how they can ingest these uh, uranium uh, and strontiums and plutoniums and become their own little nuclear engines. And d think of these as dust like fine dust. You remember how you get a sunny day, no matter how much you clean the house, no matter how clean that house is, you're still going to see the dust in that high sun. Well, this stuff is much smaller than that. And you know how that dust in the sun in your home floats around so gently, so easily? It doesn't... It, well, these buckyballs that we're talking about, they're the same thing, except they're much smaller. And so the prevailing winds will carry it right across the ocean, right around the planet. They can float right here, right now, with like a diver on, in the ocean where he gets neutral buoyancy. And he can just stay there. If he drowned it when he was doing that, he would just float along for, until he, you know, well, once he, once he started uh, decaying, then he'd fill up with air and he would float up. But say he was getting all the air he needed, and then that's all he'd done with neutral buoyancy, and he had an endless air supply on his back, and he was able to, he just went unconscious, he never died, and he had a full face helmet on. That's why I used to wear the full face, was in case I passed out. Because you could pass out, right? In the hypoxy. Um, I digressed, I know. Okay. Not much. Because I wanna, just want to break this down for everybody. So, and once again, there's, st you know, we got the studies below of these plumes were detected by planes in large concentrations in an 18 hour period and they never were warned the population to stay indoors for those couple of days of spikes here and a few days of spikes there. But it, was, it shows that it was still there the whole time. But there was a couple of days where it had spiked really high and they were up in their plane, the Canadian government that should be sitting on a nuclear waste site now. So should every plane that flies across the Atlantic or the Pacific. And so these plumes are real, a hundred million percent. 
So it's not just that purple ocean that is missing many, many, many millions of more datas. Well, because there's three pool, uh, three explosions, hydrogen explosions, and one alleged nuclear detonation. And the pools are missing in a couple of them, obviously. Do you need anybody to tell you that there's no pools there? That used to be a 10-story building. And the frame you see there is wider than a big SUV, just the framing itself. If the SUV was to park, it can park in on that frame and drive back and forward on it. I don't know if you can turn around, but I think you probably could. That's how big the framing is on that building because that was built into the building. And uh, they said they were going to use vacuums to clean out the pools, obviously, because you can't get in the pools of some of the pools that are still there. But see, you can't use a vacuum to clean out what's there. There's only one, and that's building four. That shot's from building four. So how are you going to get a vacuum cleaner to suck all the dust out and then say, and to suck all of that stuff out? It doesn't work that way. That stuff is all tangled up. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me keep going. There's not much more there. Well, there's a lot more. I can go back up and go for three hours. Let's sit on that picture. Come over and say hi to a few people. Because I got so I tracked myself that time. I got to watch it. Okay, here we go. I'll bring up that page. And I like that picture just because it's uh, it's fitting with what we see coming out of the media that the fact that they try to uh, marginalize everything with bananas. And that should be right there. I don't know why I'm miss missing that. Hang on. Right, here we go. Sheeple, radiated sheeple. So we went from just being sheeple to radiated sheeple because of these plumes. And I got the links below to these VETA studies, peer review academic studies, that has uh, showed the history of that stuff. So once again, before I come to the comment section, I'm just letting it warm up there. Bananas are, you can't get cancer from bananas. Right? You can eat as many as you want, and you're not going to get no cancer from bananas, no matter. Uh, and it's just normal, insignificant uh, background radiation that media tries to use all the time. But if you took those numbers and you got the same amount of the cesium or the same amount of uranium or the same amount of plutonium or the same amount of... And it's the same thing with the normal water background radiation. Now... Uh, I'll just stop in that picture for a second because the the isotopes that have come across, a lot of that, you know, because there's hundreds of thousands of tons got atomized down on top of these 9,000 degree Fahrenheit's and, and turned into death plumes that went up and got into the death streams and came over and came down like death storms, which the Canadian government flew planes through. And so our water is going to be contaminated too. And I got something important coming up, and there's a link below to it after. But the background radiation of rocks got nothing to do with E equals MC square ever, under any circumstances. It's insignificant radiation. You can't use the radiation from that to make a bomb. You have to, to process it and enrich it and mine the mountains. And you'll only get 0.02% of the mountains take that'll be usable for fusion or for nuclear bombs, nuclear weapons, and but now they're making isotopes for, for uh, directed energy weapons and lasers. And uh, of course lasers have been around for 50 years and they celebrated that last year, the 50th anniversary, publicly. And in the 60s, uh, now that's a radiated potato. I hope that's the one I got there. But the sunlight background radiation 
um, is not the radiation that we're talking about. It's got nothing to do with the radiation that makes the ocean look like that. The sun never ever done that. Potatoes never ever done that. Bananas never ever done that. The rocks that are indigenous to planet Earth never done that. Radiation has been on this planet for billions of years, but not that enriched stuff, right? And we've this is unprecedented. We're the hundred percent meltdown. We've never had that happen on Earth. And the, the only backup plan was built into the site where the core melts down, hits the bedrock, the ocean comes in on top of it, or the river flushes it out and the ocean moves it away. And because where Japan is, it's got the jet stream right over it, carries it over to North America, but it's got the Pacific brine. The currents whisk it away from British, uh, Japan's coastline immediately, just whisk it away constantly like a vacuum because where they got their plant, they created a back eddy where it only has the one entrance in there. And so the water stays still, but it has to come out that one entrance. So the surface currents go in, circles around, they probably got pumps originally out there. Uh, and it, that's where they had the pumps um, in the back of that, Eddie, for, so they did have a draw there, back there, but all the release seems to be coming straight out into that, um, that chunk where the Pacific brine carries it away immediately. And so they go a couple of miles offshore and the radiation is being moved very fast away from the shoreline for the first 10 to 20 miles. And so when they go out and catch fish uh, that are habitual to those areas, when you take some of these rock cods that they're talking about, they generally don't, they don't leave sight of their nest, of their little, uh, they'll defend those rocks. I've been down there I've had little fish come up and slam into my face mask because I, I work for six hours a day where you have hundreds of fish will follow you around all day. But I've seen fish that will not get off their spot. And so you work around that spot um, just so you won't disturb them because they obviously got their eggs there and they lived there. But over the 14 years of diving, that's one thing I noticed was a lot of times fish will swim in one spot and when the tide changes, they'll go play around for 20 minutes or half an hour during the slack tide and then they'll swim this way for six hours. And then when the tide goes slack, they'll go down and they'll play around. And if it gets dark, they'll just go hide in one of the rock outcroppings. Even at low tide, fish will, at two feet below the water, I've seen ling cod that had to be 20, 25 pounds. I've seen octopus 60, 70, 80 pounds in a foot of water at low tide, just jammed into little nooks and crannies. You can literally go down, grab a, reach down and pick up huge mass of fish. Well, you used to be, you can't do that in the Pacific anymore. Well, you can, but not for much longer because there's no oxygen left behind where that plume goes. It kills all the oxygen. It kills all the ability of the ocean to produce oxygen. It kills all the, the microscopic animals, which are the most important part of the ocean, whether you realize realizing it or not. And it kills, of course, the feeder fish, because they're the smallest things at the beginning of the food chain, because radiation is energy. It's outputting energy constantly. Oh, God, I went off to a long ramble. I'm sorry. Uh, hi, Ivan. Annabeck. Hi, Mickey. I see, yeah. Hi, Lori. Yeah, Edge Trolling. He's PR firm. Don't mind him. Let him go. I'm going to take screen captures of everything Edge says. And I'm going to come out with a video in a day or two and just destroy him. So... Let them go. I'm looking forward to it. We need a scatter troll anyway. Dana, dang, SFP blew up and the rods broke apart. Right, and fission. So when those reactors um, went snappy, snappy and blew up, it's got to come down. Sorry, folks. What have we got going on here? Hang on. So these death plumes, if you want to go over, Ed, now I sent you the links to this stuff today, Ed, and read some of this stuff, right? Then even that little tiny mine of yours could actually work out what we're talking about here. 
But you can go ahead and troll me all you want, and I'll tear your comments apart in the video just to teach the other PR firms to show them what kind of murderers uh, they are by lying. I can show you all the information, and Ed will go there, and he'll just lie. Nope, not true. Nope, 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 nope. The people who wrote that peer review study were on crack. Uh, who believes the, the Washington blog anyway? Right, Ed? You know, and that's amazing that, uh, especially tonight when we're, we're really covering things well, uh, now, this is a peer review study, folks, and that link is below. And it's about, uh, it also covers the who else peer reviewed this study in that article. It's an updated article about how DCA, which is just a mineral, and you can order it online. You can get your pharmacist to order it in. You have to ask them, and you can get your health food shops to order that in. You just got to ask them if you don't have it, because a lot of people don't understand anything about that. It's a little known it's got no patent on it. It's benign to humans. It's been used in exotic diseases. Its history is well known. And there is no patent on it. But it has this remarkable property. And that link below uh, cures cancer. right? And the nuclear industry wants to radiate you to try to cure your cancer. But what radiation, the only way to cure cancer in somebody, you have to kill all the cells in their body and hope they survive it. It's the most stupidest way ever to try to cure cancer because it has nothing to do with curing cancer. It's $50,000 uh, pop for the patients. So it's about uh, getting their assets before they, and killing them. It's actual, truly murder. Uh, everything to do with radiation is murder. And as this murders the planet, like it murdered the Philippines, I'd like to see Ed go down there to the Philippines and take a little walk through that place and see what the radiation from the ocean done to the Philippines and see if he's throw yourself on one of those cracked off trees as a symbolism to the nuclear industry that they're inherently evil, that would be a, a, a sign of goodwill, right? And it's sad but true that there are people that really can make a difference and won't try. We got all of our universities, we need 4,200 peer review academics to go to work every single day. Because right now there's 4,200 published every day. But a lot of these started two years ago. But every day, there's three a minute, all day long. And there's 1.6 million academic journals a year. And 99.99999 of them are locked away in the ivory towers. You paid for them. Your children produced them. You paid for the institutions, the universities, the academics. You paid for the professors. You paid for the heats, the lights. You paid for your children to go to those colleges. Uh, you probably will for another 20 years. And then they lock it all up with Elsevier, Springer, and Wiley so that they can deny you the ability to flush them out. And then they want to come out and tell you about bananas as background radiation and try to put that into the equation. And that's murder. Everybody says stuff like that is a murder. Ed's a murderer. He's here on our site tonight. And you can't change a murderer. That's the reality of it. Once a murderer, always a murderer. And that's how they make their money, is murdering people. And so we got to get a list of these people and hang them in the streets in the future when it all goes to shit anyway. But it, there's a point when that's going to happen and we got no choice. Right now, we got to try and save this planet. We got to try. Don't let the last stand of the human race be that we didn't even try, that we're all too busy watching CNN or Fox News or BBC or Hollywood fantasies, speaking of. Speaking of, let me cover that one. Uh, this is intriguing, I think. This is very intriguing. And so I didn't get rid of that page. Here it is. So, where is it to? Hang on. I watched a movie, 500 mile an hour storm. 500 MPH storm. And because I'm watching all these new global warming videos that came out in the last two years, and this one's 2013. And a massive hurricane, hurricane, hurricane sweeps into cities, into the stratosphere sweeps cities into the stratosphere. 
and tears a hole in the ozone. But um, when you're watching that video, you get about 10 minutes in, and you're going to see them. They ran out of their house, jumped in their car, and then they went inside, drove inside of this building, and then they got forced out of the building. So when you drive out of the building, you're going to see graphics there that's actually Fukushima. The destruction, that's Fukushima. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And that story is based upon this theory of, of the meltdown in a reactor on top of that. And they actually use a laser in the end of the movie to kill the supercell storms. How intriguing. So that came out in 2013. But, uh, you know, this is the story we heard from the Philippines, isn't it? 100%. 195 mile an hour winds. They were lucky. It was blown over 300 miles an hour. It should have been on the end of the moon. It was 100 miles wide. But that's a really interesting one, so i got to go deeper down the rabbit hole on that. But it, 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 uh, at some point, they say, where they get the melted reactor, that means the whole planet's full bird. Think about that one. 100% meltdown, see? Well, Fukushima's got three. And so there's a whole lot of parallels, including footage from Fukushima that CGI'd into the footage of the damage. This is inconceivable, but true. You can see it right after they drive it to the building. You'll start seeing graphics. Start stopping your video and looking around. Won't it? It'll be on your left-hand side of the TV screen. And uh, I thought that was like, <laughs> wow, land. The parallels are many. So what happened was Hollywood got a budget and they got a project because they also talk in that movie about how two tornadoes converge. Just like the typhoons that converged on Fukushima or uh, Fukushima and Japan and Tokyo and then moved straight down and destroyed the Philippines is exactly how these tornadoes affects the cities there and they got up to 500 miles an hour. What have I been telling you folks for the last couple of weeks straight? I mean that's Hollywood that uh, was, was tasked with doing a movie of a prediction that somebody was given in the know. That's how most Hollywoods are, uh, these science fiction, global warming. They're all based upon radiation. Nothing to do with plastic and tin cans and pop bottles, okay? They're based upon real models and you get Hollywood to put them together so they can visualize what the future is going to be. That's true stuff. They predict that with models, with supercomputers, accurately. So accurately, we just seen an actual real-life one in the Philippines where there's nothing left standing. I watched, uh, I spent most of the day listening to lectures on radiation, but like I did yesterday and the day before, but um, I have to break away once in a while. And so the global warming, I want to see how they're always shoving that. Now, I've watched this several times, and they didn't catch a lot of that stuff till the night because my mind gets occupied like everybody else. And so let's come over and wind down and say hi to everybody. It's going to be a short video tonight. I uh, just want to throw out a couple of more headlines before I come over. Dead sea creatures covered 98% of the seafloor last year, about 150 miles off the California coast. I spent 14 years on the ocean floor. 14 years, 6 hours a day, 315 days a year. I ran the biggest operations on the east and the west coast of Canada. And I used to do 100-day trips back to back. I've been on about 4,000 up to 26,000 islands up here. And I, and I worked alongside of most of those, or been dragged on the boat, rather, I should say, along most of those. Because that's what I would do. I would hang off the side of the boat and get dragged along the coastline looking for Davy Jones Locker in my spare time. Was another favorite thing I would always do. And I would cover miles and miles of coastline. And so that's, that, to me, is a fascinating story, okay? 98% of the seafloor last year. They're talking about... Uh, and what they're talking about, you know, is a frightening thought. Now, another... i got two more to cover here for the comment sections. The miles of anchovies, mountains deep. They can't come down the coastline, see? They can't get down there because the death plume got them ca cut off, right? Think about how the current moves along right boat oceans. See that? Now, think about how that is actually something like that in six years' time. That's the model for six years, based upon two weeks' release. 
So we're going to put all the plutonium, the strontium, the uraniums, and all the family trees of the cesium, not just the 137. Certainly, you're not even going to bother with the iodine that only got an eight-day half-life because that ocean only got a three-year half-life. And so we want to play with real numbers because the urgency is very real. And I'll come over to the comments. With that picture... The anchovies never showed up here off British Columbia. Hundreds of saners went out there and never got a single one because they couldn't make it here. They just can't make it here. That's why the whales are not seeing it. That's why they found all the herring that were bleeding at all their orifices and their fins and their eyeballs. That's why we got all these turtles where dogs were dying when they tried to eat them because they're so contaminated because they floated ashore and they floated through all this very, very, very toxic. There was trillion, 2.3 trillion airborne uh, plutonium in the first four days and I got links below to the studies that Canada done of the airborne and so that never stopped because it hemorrhaged out of there at that Balza Hill and once again once again I want you to remember that the buckyball and how it becomes its own little nuclear monster and so if that was a land in your swimming pool full of uh, microbe life it would cook everything in that swimming pool and you could take it and put it in another swimming pool of life, and it would cook everything in that swimming pool because it's putting out energy to back walls. Think of a back wall, it has enough energy. Not only is it traveling at supersonic speeds, but it's, um, it can do that at enormous rates per second. And so there's trillions and trillions and hundreds of trillions of disintegrations uh, in certain parts of the ocean. There's nothing could survive through that, you know and through our ear is cooking and everything and we have the ability to at least try we deserve a chance to try see and the people that want to pretend this is not serious or that this is insignificant or that um, it'll just go away when you look at the philippines you can easily understand the urgency that we're up against that ocean is not going to die, and I'm going to come over. I'm coming over to the conversation right there in a moment. I'll just bring up this picture here. See, really, truly says it all for me. See, that's got nothing to do with bananas. That's got nothing to do with potato background radiation. That's got nothing to do with rocks uh, radiation. That's got nothing to do with uh, Ed, who has three counts in his name. Uh, Hi, Providence, it's uh, Angel. And let me come up and check the time for folks. Yeah, 47. We're going to wind her down. We'll be gone in three to four minutes, folks. I'm just going to come in. I'll catch a couple of comments, and I'll say hi. Hi, T. Callis. Ivan. Anna Beck. Once again, folks, I'll come in and get all your comments after. You're welcome, third watch. Yeah, I am. That's true. I don't know how I do it every day. You know, I, I don't feel. I don't feel right if I'm not li listening to lectures all day. I don't feel right if I'm not searching all day, about this, I'm trying to understand it, trying to get a handle on it, just in case there is something. Uh, important. I don't want to miss it. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Joe Real. Hi, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Bill Reed. Nuts for art. Yeah, they're not big, no. They're itty big. They're so, they're, they're the smallest you can imagine. They're on, uh, I can't remember the scale. I got a link below to the peer review study. They'll tell you. Um, but it's way smaller than your DNA. Way smaller. And unbelievably dangerous, inconceivable to their own little nuclear engines. It's a phenomenon because of spraying salt water on the reactors, the sulfur. Uh, Sergeant York, Annie, yeah, I hear for you, honey. Yeah, well, keep your common sense to yourself, Ed. You got three accounts in your name. You come in, you spam lawyers. I took screen captures of them. 
It's all fables. Hi, Duane, Lisa. Yeah, we'll see you passing through, bud. Hold your head up, bud. Bystander witness. Kathy, hi, Kathy, thank you. 33, three, thank you. Daisy, yeah. P.O. Scott, Elizabeth. Uh, gee, got jumped again on the names. Sorry, folks. Albert, Broken Ass Honor, T. Jimmy Joe, Sergeant, Nuts for Art, Dwayne, Knights. Uh, Knight Rider, is it? I can't. Can't. John. Philip. Uh, once again. Camshaft. Sergeant. And everybody else. Uh, let me see. Donna, Elizabeth, Junkyard, Kircher K. Sylvia, Christopher, Jester, Jimmy. Broken Ass Islanders. Zip Free, Miss Frill, Making Buck, Philip, Stormy Clouds, Canterbury, Whoa, Lunar. Yeah, that's quite a few names again. That's good. I'll do a better job each night. And we'll stick to the facts. And the PR firms will just eviscerate them as they show up. And tomorrow night, uh, Tomorrow, I think I'm just going to do a recap of everything I got imported into these files right here. So, so that's everything over the last 49 days that I got imported. I'm going to go through them one at a time. And uh, so that will take close to an hour. But it'll certainly be a, a recap because I can add new information to that. And, you know... I remember um, we were going to make a run one night. We have been out there for a long time on the ocean. And it was a really rough day diving. It was a couple of days for a full moon, so the tides were a lot faster. So you really got to work, swim a lot harder. And it's a lot harder, uh, you know, each day because you're doing two marathons every day on a human body. And um, I went down on the bottom. It was just like at the end of the day. And then, but that's, this was the catalyst anyway. Uh, my foot was frozen, and I had a hole, because I wear dry suits, and I had a hole uh, in the top of my boot. And so my, my, my boot was flooded, and the water was so cold that I had, uh, like, frostbite to my foot. And so I ignored it, and that just crept right up my body to my hands. And I couldn't use my hands, so I decided I was coming up. And I was having a hard time putting air in my suit. And so I was like, okay, I'll dump my weight belt in my bag, and then I'll just come up the bag line to the surface, to skinny up the bag line, like the reverse of climbing rope, so to speak, coming down a rope. You can go up a rope with no weight belt on. It's, but you got to wrap your, your, so you don't come up too fast. So the weight belt slows you down for coming up too fast, hanging on a line anyway. Long story short, I couldn't drop my weight belt. And so I'm running out of air, and I can't get air in my suit to come up. And I need air anyway in my tank so I can come up. But as I come up, the air will expand, and I'll be able to get some air into me. But I can't drop my weight belt. So I'm looking around for a clamshell or something so that I can jimmy my weight belt and just lose it right there. I don't care. I'll come back and get it after. Normally, you would take it, swing it, and drop it into your bag and then grab the line, wrap your leg around like a trapeze artist, and come up the line that way, because you don't have any weight, and you'll just get carried up automatically. And uh, uh, what I ultimately done was I ended up, because uh, I carried a lot of weight in my backpack, I took my backpack off. I usually, a lot of times I was, I can't remember how much weight that day, but a lot of times I was wearing around 100 pounds, because I work in ground swells, and so you get tossed around like in a washer if you don't. And I've done that for a long time. Um, and I had no fins. That's right. That day. That's another important thing to that story was I had no fins. But anyway, uh, ultimately I skinnied off my backpack. And I came up. And I always had an extra suit there like I, I normally would have. And I had lent it to somebody. And this suit had gotten holes in it and blah, blah, blah. So I killed off a couple of minutes on a, 
odd story, I'm sure. But anyway, yeah, no, the point was we're, we wanted to come ashore. So, okay. It's getting close to dark. It's only a couple hours to run over to Rupert. We're uh, up by Eddie's Pass. And so another boat that wasn't a very good boat decided they were going to chase us. But the wind was blowing uh, on the outside, probably about 65, 70. And the first thing that happened was their engine had to come off, and they took a wave and killed their engine. And they started drifting into the rock pile, and we went to get them. And I had an inexperienced tender with me. And so long story short was, when I went in to get them, the ocean opened up, and there was a rock, and so I ended up going full astern. And thought for sure we were going to get it, and we, we got away from it. And they went on in through it. And he had an inexperienced tender on his boat, too. And his tender was on the VHF radio. And he said, if you can get us, he said, just get me off the boat. He said, so he took over for the moik, and he just, like, just get me off the boat. And I felt so bad for him because uh, there was nothing I can do now. I couldn't go get him. I had to go around the other side and hope um, that they came out the other side, right? And so that was, uh, like, two miles out of the way. So finally got hold of him. And they went through all that rock pile. That was unbelievable, unimaginable, really. And never got hurt. <laughs> Came out the other side. And the tender, I gave him three ropes to tie on because I knew he wasn't very good at tying this way. And what he'd done was he tied, it was blown so hard, he tied a rope onto a Scotchman, which is a float, threw it in the water, and the wind just blew it right at, at um, I can't remember the name of the boat. And they wrapped it around their bow. So they had three ropes wrapped around their bow, and they were, whoo, Let's go. <laughs> and uh, we towed him in and tied, tied. I got a beach line up, hung off the beach line, put out a stern anchor. So long story short is you would tie off to a tree, back off the shoreline, and put out your stern anchor, and the tree you would tie off would be the one where the wind was coming from, and so you can go to sleep and rest, you know, because I have spent many nights sleeping with all the di all the rain gear on, survival suits on, because the wind is blowing 100 miles an hour. And I can't imagine what it could have been like. I, I remember 100 miles an hour going up to the deck of the boat, trying to check the anchor to see if I was dragging, and I couldn't lean down to the deck of the boat. It was so, that's what 100 mile an hour winds will do to you. You can't, and I was hanging on to the stay wires, trying to pull myself down to grab the anchor to see if I can feel it bumping on the ocean floor. There's not much I can do about it. What I was gonna do was cut it and ram the boat up on a beach in a little eddy there and then deal with it when the tide came back up. Uh, if it had to let go, that was the backup plan. And there you go, a little story, because I know everybody asked me last night to do one, and I almost forgot tonight. So we'll catch you guys tomorrow night, and we're going to do a recap on everything that I got here, and I'll see if I can find some other stuff and import it. And I think I can tell a much different story this time, much more accurate story this time. And so I look forward to that. We'll see you folks tomorrow night, and I'll catch the comments after. Thanks, folks. Uh, we'll appreciate it.